sermon series for the next several weeks on the life of Elijah. And we're going to look at the prophet Elijah. Uh, he is unique biblical character because he's one of the few people prophet-wise that we do not have a record of who his parents are. He basically blazes onto the scene and when he does... He just comes right into this, the picture. He is already uh, proclaiming the Word of God. Today, I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Kings. We're going to see in this scripture in 1 Kings chapter 17 today that God is doing something uh, through the prophet Elijah and the similarity, I believe, that can be related to our lives today. First, you need to know the background of what's happening. Elijah has been given a message that's not popular to tell. The message Elijah has been given is to go to the king of that region, King Ahab, who is married to a woman that is more evil than he is, Jezebel. And the message is, is because the sin that the people have embraced of worshiping other gods, that there will be a famine, there will be a drought in the land. Now, it's easy when God gives you a message. And that message is something that is prosperity and dripping with honey and sugar. It's easy to tell those kind of messages. It's easy to go knock on someone's door and say, God's got a basket of blessings for your life. It's easy to do that. But it's difficult to be able to be faithful to God and knock on someone's door and say, repent or judgment is coming your way. Elijah was given a message of hope. The hope was if they were to repent, God can forgive. But the message was because of the sin that the people have embraced the God of Baal, that there would be a famine in the land. A famine that not only affected those who have sinned, but also affected those who had not sinned. If you study the history of this time period, you'll find that Israel was in a very sinful state, almost as if America today is in a very sinful state. That Israel had embraced the gods of their enemies. Years earlier, you would never have seen that in Israel. But at this period of time, they have embraced the Baals. They have embraced the asterisks. They embraced the other pagan gods. And God sends a man to come and give a proclamation. To give a prophecy. And say that it's time that you realize... That your sins have been seen by God and you will pay the price for those sins. So there's a famine that comes, we find in chapter 17. And in the very first part of chapter 17, verse 1 through 7, just to summarize that and then I will read to you starting with verse 8, is that when the famine comes, that God has Elijah to go down to a brook, this area that has some water there. Uh, water was a very precious commodity during a famine. When there's no rain, water is something that could be traded as in silver and gold because it's very precious. Everyone needs it. And while he's there, God tells Elijah, I'm going to take care of your needs. In fact, I'm going to make sure you have something to eat in the morning and something to eat at night. I tell you, that's more than some of us are guaranteed, isn't it? And I see some married people shaking their heads and hoping their spouse doesn't see. I will not sell you out and say who was shaking their head. But God uses a very unique way of feeding Elijah. He doesn't send a, a bus or he doesn't send a caravan of camels or whatever with uh, bags from Hardee's in it or McDonald's. He doesn't have prepackaged meals like that. God uses his own animals, his own creation, and sends an animal that the Jewish people would consider to be a dirty animal, a raven, to come and bring food in the morning and at night. I want to tell you this, is God can provide for your needs in the most unlikely ways. And here he takes care of him. But there's a point that even while God's taking care of him, the brook dries up. When there's no rain, eventually that little stream, it dries up. And God now tells Elijah that it's time for him to move on. And verse 8 is where we pick up. 
He moves on and it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, meaning Elijah. Get up and go to Zarephath. Now Zarephath is not a Jewish territory. Zarephath is a Gentile area. In fact, it is an area that the Queen Jezebel, it's some of her people's territory. And so now Elijah, who is on the hit list for Ahab and Jezebel because of the message of God that's been given to him, he's now being sent to her backyard. And it says, go to Zarephath that belongs to Sidon and stay there. Look, I have commanded a woman who is a widow to provide for you there. One of the most unlikely resources God's going to use. One, He's going to use a Gentile to bless a Jew. Two, God is going to use a woman who had no resources of her own or very little to be a blessing to someone else. How many of you understand today the principle that a little is a lot in the hands of God? You might be sitting here today saying, but pastor, that little children's sermon you gave, and you pulled out that penny, that sure would help me this week. Because you know what it means to have just a little. Here we see that God's going to use a Gentile to be a blessing to one of His people. And also God's going to use a woman. So women, listen up. God will use you also, no matter what anyone says. And He's also going to use a woman who is very poor and considered one of the least of these because she was a widow. In verse 10 it says, so Elijah got up. He listened to God. It was something that sounded foolish to the natural ear. Go down to this area of your enemy. Get ready to be fed by someone who can't even feed themselves. It does not record saying Elijah said, but God, that doesn't make sense. Now today we would do that, but God, that doesn't make a lot of sense. And God would say back to us, I use the foolish things of this world. And see, my friends, today Elijah was obedient. Why? Because Elijah remembered that God used a raven to feed him when he was there by a brook of water that dried up. If God can do that, God can also use this woman. And then it continues. So Elijah went down to Zarephath, and when he arrived at the city gates, there was a widow woman gathering wood. It was actually, if you look at the original Hebrew, she's gathering sticks, just uh, small amounts in the street. She's gathering up this, this pile of sticks because she's about to cook her final meal. It says, Elijah called her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup and let me drink. Now, if you're reading this and do not understand the context, you might not see the value of that. But when you know that water was precious, that water was valuable, and for him, a stranger, to go in and ask for something like that made absolutely no sense. But you see, God was testing the obedience of this widow woman because God knew that if she would supply for the needs of Elijah, God was about to supply all her needs in the very near future. And it says that Elijah asked for this cup of water. In verse 11, And she went to get it. Would we be obedient to the Word of God? When God speaks to you and I to do something, even if it's something as small as a cup of water in the name of Jesus, would you be obedient to do it? Here it says that she goes to get it. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. Now I can tell Elijah had some Baptists in him. The reason why I say that is because Elijah comes into the town, this new preacher on the scene, and the first thing he wants is something to eat. But notice, all of this is to set up a blessing for a woman. Verse 17, or excuse me, verse 12. It says, but she said. Now notice it was one thing to bring a cup of water. But now he's asking for some bread. It says, but she said, as the Lord your God lives, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in the jar. 
and a bit of oil in the jug. Just now I'm gathering a couple sticks in order to go prepare it for myself and my son so that we may eat it and die. This is a woman that's desperate. This is a woman that's walking through the streets in a state of depression. Some of you have been desperate, haven't you? Some of you have been depressed. Some of you felt like that you had nowhere to turn. And then all of a sudden, God sends someone in your path. You know what? That this meeting of Elijah and this widow woman was not by accident. God knew that Elijah needed the blessings of this widow woman. And God knew this widow woman needed the blessings of Elijah. You know why? It's because we all need, now listen to me, we all need one another. A man of God needed a Gentile woman. A Gentile woman needed a man of God. There's people today right now, do you know, that you might be spoke to by God. The Spirit of God is speaking to you to go bless that person, to do something for this person. You say, but God, that makes absolutely no sense. But what God is doing is setting you up to be a blessing to that person. So in turn, that person becomes a blessing to you. You don't do it to get a blessing. You do it because of obedience. But it's the law of planting that seed of faith. Listen to God, knowing that there will be an abundance of blessings on your life. And here it says that she tells him, I don't have but just some oil, I have some flour, and I'm about to go cook this and die. She tells him, I don't have any bread. But you know what? She had the ingredients. <laughs> some of you, you'll get this at lunch. Some of you today... <clears throat> Are looking at your life and all the things that you don't have. I don't have an education. I've not been to college. I don't have a pile of money. I can't go on a mission trip overseas. I can't do this. I can't do that. But God is looking at your life. And He is seeing the ingredients. All the things that, that you do have. And God says I can take a little of this. And I can take a little of that. And a pinch of this. And a cup of that. And I can make you what you need to be. My friends that's what. God is doing to this church right now in our very midst that God can take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and He can put it all together to make it the kind of church that He has deemed it to be. You see, we overlooked that real quick. The woman says, I have this and I have that. But Elijah didn't ask for this and that. He asked for what it can make. And here we see it says this. In verse 13, then Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Why? Because you know for a fact that taking a leap of faith can be scary. Being obedient to God, you might say, oh, it's so joyful. And it is. But it can be scary. That first mission trip you go on can be scary. That, that first time that you decide that you're going to surrender your life to God and, and do something out of the, out of the normal. Tell your boss about Jesus while your boss is sitting there cursing at you. To, to do something that's unusual can be a little scary. But here he says, don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a small loaf from it and bring it out to me. Afterwards, you may make some for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord God of Israel says. The flour jar will not become empty, and the oil jug will not run dry until the day the Lord sends the rain on the surface, surface of the land. Here I love that because Elijah is having faith in what God is saying. Elijah tells this woman, he says, look, I know that you're about to go cook a meal that you think is going to be your last meal, but you don't even understand that behind the milk jug that's already got the expiration date that's passed, behind there is food that you ain't even seen, Shug. It, but behind the cabinets, when you open it up, you thought that cabinet was empty. Yeah, that cabinet might look empty, but go open up the other cabinets in the kitchen because there's food there that you didn't even realize that was there. The, Elijah's saying, if you'll be obedient, God going to bless you. I can remember back in 19, 
uh, 86 it was, I believe, in that range, uh, somewhere in that time frame, uh, my mom and I, we were wondering what we were going to do about food and what we were going to do about she was going to try to pay the light bill. You might say, uh, Pastor, you, you got it pretty good now. But I'm going to tell you, I can remember. I can remember just as if it were yesterday, my mama sitting on the couch crying and wondering where in the world, what am I going to do to feed this young and what am I going to do to pay this light bill? And it wasn't because my mama was out gambling or, or throwing her money out for something. It was just because at that time there was only one income and, and she couldn't hardly make it. And I remember just as it was yesterday that somehow there were some people that found out that my mama didn't have not a bit of food in the cabinets. And you know what happened? It was people that did not even go to church with her. It was a completely different church. We went to a Pentecostal holiness church. And guess what? The Baptists in that town, before we, I even became Baptist, I'm going to tell you, this is how God lines everything up. They come driving up some Baptist men and some pickup trucks, and they had these bags from Peter Wiggly. Somehow, someone told them, you know what, there's a woman over there that's working Monday through Friday. She's working down at the sewing plant in Clinton, and she's got a boy over there, and they're trying to make it the best they can. But you know, there ain't even no food in the house. And I can remember them men bringing those bags of groceries in the house, and my mama sitting there just crying and saying, I, I don't deserve this. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, yeah, but I'd like to have them potato chips. <laughs> I think about it. I, I was excited. I didn't understand. I saw it as these men doing this. But now as a man myself, I don't see it as the men doing it. I saw it as God doing it. God was opening up the storeroom of blessings. And you know what? I can't remember a day that I went to bed hungry. Why? Because God was doing what God knew He was going to do. Now let me flip the coin on that. I can also remember that same time period when my mama went down to social services trying to get what they call food stamps. I, I've had the cheese that came in the block. I've had the, the peanut butter that came in the white container. It was a bit, I thought everybody had that kind of peanut butter. My peanut butter didn't have a first name. I, it, it had USDA on it. My, my hot dog didn't even have a, a last name. The point I'm getting at is I remember those days when you get big bags of rice. And what in the world are you going to do with all this rice? The thing is, I remember that life. And I remember my mama going down to Clinton to the social services and sitting there and trying to get some help. And the woman looked at my mama and said, you know what? All week in the government, we, we're, going to, we're going to help you. But, but based on this, if you can have one more child. That we can, we'll be able to do, oh, you can quit your job. I remember this as a young child listening to that woman. I don't remember everything about my childhood, but there's some things I remember just as if it happened yesterday. And I remember sitting there listening to this government employee tell my mama that if you have another baby, another child, oh, we can do so much more. And I remember the, what my mama said. My mama, being from Sampson County, she just plain spoken. She said, but you don't understand. I just told you I, I'm not married. My husband's left me. It's just me and my boy. And the woman looked at her and said, I didn't say you had to have the baby with your husband. Just that you had to have another child. Do you know what that did that day? My mama said, you can just forget it then. I, that day, it molded something in my mind and made me who I am now. That I believe for a fact, yes, it's all right if we, if we can help that person. I'm not against welfare. I'm not against food stamps. But I'm going to tell you what I am against. I'm against when the government tries to become God. I, I'm against when the government says, if you do something that's immoral, we'll bless you more. And that's what we're living in today. From the White House down to the General Assembly in North Carolina, we're living in that kind of society. And the church is saying what? The church is saying, well, let the government take care of it. There used to be a time when the church came together and said, you know what? I got an extra bag of apples. I got some bread here. I got a milk, a, a jug of milk here. You know, I don't got a lot, but I can pick up an extra can of, of pork and beans at the store. And we'll bring it together and we'll go bless that lady so she doesn't have to go grovel to the government. My friends, you'll never know the future pastor. You'll never know the future minister that you were feeding when he was a child.
You see, here we see this. It says Elijah tells her, don't be afraid to go and do this. That God's going to bless her. And that what she has, it will not run out because of God. And in verse 15, it says, so she proceeded to do according to the word of Elijah. Then the woman, then the woman, Elijah, and her household ate. How long? For many days. For many days. Why? Because God is not a liar. If God says it, you can take it all the way to the bank. It says that she ate for many days her whole household. The flour jar did not become empty. If you mark in your Bibles, if you have a pew Bible, don't do this. But if it's your Bible and you want to underline that, that's a perfect phrase to underline. And the flour jar didn't go empty. Some of you right now are, are looking at your what God is doing for you. You say, yeah, but it ain't going to last. I, I mean, I've seen a move of God in churches and people say, yeah, it's good that Sunday school attendance is up, but you know it ain't going to last. You know what? It can last. When revival breaks loose, there's no such thing as having a, a cutoff time. And then it says the, the jar didn't run dry according to the word of the Lord. And he had spoken through Elijah. Now, i got just a few moments, and I'm going to use those few moments. I want to tell you this. It all seems like things are going great. It seems like they are on top of the world. They've been blessed. They're highly favored. They have God's provision right in their home, and their, in their community. While everyone else is going without God's blessing, those who are faithful. But it's kind of like I can remember going down... Well, actually, it's going up, if you're from North Carolina, going up to Bush Gardens and riding on one of those rides. Uh, it's, when you get on one of these rides and it clicks you up in the air, the roller coaster, you know, it's, oh, man, it's, you're going up and it's slow and you click, 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 click. You know, this ain't so bad. But you realize as more it highs goes up, there's about to be a change. And there's about to be a change in this biblical account. They're going up, click, 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 and then they get right at the top, and something bad's about to happen. How many of you know that you've had some good days? You've had some great days. You've had some days that you just kicked off your shoes and said, Honey, this is, this is the Lord is in this place, right? And then something about to happen. Let's look at it real quick. Verse 17. After this, after what? After the blessings. After God moved. It says, after this, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. His illness became very severe until no more breath remained in him. She said to Elijah, man of God, what do we have in common? Have you come to remind me of my guilt and kill my son? But Elijah said to her, Give me your son. So she took him from his arms and brought him up to the upper room. And when he was staying, where he was staying, and he laid on him on his own bed, and then he cried out to the Lord and said, My Lord God, have you also brought tragedy to this widow I am staying with by killing her son? Verse 21. And then he stretched himself out over the boy three times. He cried out to the Lord and said, My Lord God, please let this boy's life return to him. So the Lord listened to Elijah's voice. The boy's life returned to him and he lived. And then Elijah took the boy and brought him down from the upper room and to the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, Look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know you are a man of God and that the Lord's words are from your mouth are true. Now today I want to say this as we get ready to wrap this sermon up. We need to remember that just because everything is going great doesn't mean it's going to stay great. Christians do have bad days. Satan will not have dominion over you, but Satan can attack you. Satan can cause you to have problems in your family, in your relationships at work, at school. 
But understand this, no matter how big the problem Satan presents and how much he attacks you and how hard you feel like you've been beaten down, you have a God who can bring life to death. You have a God that can look at something and say, man says it has ended, but God says I still got some more work for it to be to do. You see, Romans 1.17, it says this, a very simple, short verse. The just shall live by faith. Elijah didn't understand why this boy died. There's going to be some things, friends, that you're not going to understand. And you know what? That's all right. You don't have to understand it. The one thing you need to understand is that God changes not. And here Elijah didn't understand why did the boy die. But Elijah did understand this. Is that this woman had been blessed earlier because she was obedient. And now what has happened is that now God's testimony is going to be challenged. This boy hadn't done anything wrong, but the boy had died. Now, let's see this. In Psalm 37, 19, it says this. It is promised to those that trust in God that they shall not be ashamed in evil times. But in the day of famine, they shall be satisfied. I close this message with this to you. Is that when Elijah took that boy up to where Elijah was staying, they had like a little guest part of the house that Elijah would have been in. When he took that boy up, don't you know that Elijah had to have some, some severe praying to God? It says that Elijah went to God and prayed. Friends, why? Because he knew that what was the most valuable thing to that woman was that boy. That boy. And see, the woman, yes, she believed while they were eating the bread and while they were having food to eat. The woman believed because, she, remember, it says the jar didn't run out of oil and the flour jar didn't go out. And that she saw blessings every day that God was feeding them. But all of a sudden, something bad happens. And it's beyond bad. And if you've ever lost a child in here, know that that the feeling that that has, it never leaves you. And here this woman sees this boy that, remember, sometime earlier she was preparing for his and her death. Remember that last meal they were going to cook. And now the boy's dead. But Elijah goes to the one who gives life. You see, this is not the only time that we see something like this. This is a hope. I want to give you this. This is a hope even in the old testament of resurrection because you see when the spirit left the boy the body was dead but Elijah knew that the spirit doesn't die you, you got a spirit living inside of you that will never die it will live somewhere forever you're either going to live in heaven or you're going to live in hell it, it, it will not die you will live for eternity somewhere and here we see that this woman has her faith tested. But yet when Elijah comes down, I, I mean, I can almost visualize it in my mind. Elijah coming down those wooden steps of that, of that uh, Jewish woman's home, coming down with that boy. We don't know how old the boy was, but she come, he comes down with her and says, Look at here. Why does he have to say that? Because you know for a fact that woman, a widow woman, Sitting there crying her eyes out. Tears running down her face. Her hands, I imagine, were probably pressed upon the palms or her palms of her hands on her head. And Elijah says, look. She looks up. Your boy lives. My friends, I'm going to tell you this. Wipe the tears from your face. Remove your hands from your eyes. And look. The problem you thought and the situation you thought was dead, God will bring life to it. But we must be obedient. Amen. We must be obedient. Today, if you're not saved, the question of the hour is this, why not? Knowing that if you're not saved, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But then the next part, it says, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you are obedient to Him, no, you might not have a steak dinner every night, 
But I'll tell you this, God will not abandon you. God will bless you. I don't know of any of God's people right now that says that God has left them because God will not leave you even whenever you feel like that you are on the top of the mountain. I mean, things are going great and we don't even, even think about God. We just enjoy the blessings. God's there. But God's also there whenever we start taking a downward fall. God's still there with us. If you need to rededicate yourself today, that's a very important thing also in the life of a church. I, I will tell you this, that I believe in daily rededication. That We get up in the morning and we say, God, throughout this day, I want to be the very best I can be for you. But I know I might stumble and I might say something I shouldn't say, do something I shouldn't do, think something I shouldn't think. And because of that, God, I want you to be with me. And then when I lay down at night, and I guess it's the old Pentecostal coming out of me, I say, Lord, if I've done something, please forgive me throughout the day. And even if it's something I didn't realize I did do. It's not because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my salvation, but it's because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my testimony. And so I pray that at night. I pray, God, forgive me. Because I want to rededicate myself. I want to be a better pastor. I want to be a better father. But most importantly, I want to be a better child of God. Don't you? So today that's the challenge, the gift to you is that salvation. I'm going to ask our pianist to come forward and we're about to have a word of prayer. Father.